Lion in the Wind, Chapter 14 Bergen stared in dismay as Gorg soldiers tossed papers, equipment and parts everywhere as they searched for anything of interest in the room. One of the Gorg soon walked up to a box of parts and picked up an arm. Leave those alone, you brute, snarled Persia. One of the Gorg soldiers walked over and smacked her in the face with the butt of his rifle. Shut up you stupid cat, he muttered. Persia snarled in return and prepared to leap as the Gorg aimed his rifle at her. Sit down, little lady, or I'll scatter your brains all over the wall, said the Gorg. Bergen grabbed Persia around the neck and hugged her tightly. Calm down, sweetie. This won't do us any good. Help will come in time, but we have to stay alive until then. One of the Gorg sergeants let out a sour, raunchy laugh. You'll only live if you behave. Why do we have to keep them alive? grunted one of the soldiers. Because we were told to, that's why, grunted the Gorg sergeant in reply. He then glared at the doctor, and said, but I'd prefer to see them all dead. Just then the door opened and Delgra and Silvers were shoved into the room. Sit down, grunted a Gorg soldier as he forced them to their knees. Both officers quickly stood to their feet. The Gorg aimed his rifle at them and growled angrily. I said sit down. Enough. You shoot him and I'll personally execute you, growled the Gorg sergeant. The soldier glared at the sergeant, gave an angry grunt and then lowered his rifle. Just then Mestra walked into the laboratory followed by two more Gorg soldiers. Are they all here? he asked. Just as you ordered, sir grunted one of the Gorg sergeants. Mestra looked at the other two and gave a devilish grin. Well, hello, Major. How are you this fine evening? I hope you weren't hurt too badly by my men, he said gloatingly. Mestra, are you part of this? replied Delgra in disgust. Part of it? Of course I'm part of it. I'm leading this raid, you idiot, barked Mestra. Why, you're a Yigson officer, said Delgra in disbelief. Mestra laughed hysterically. Yigson? Did you really think I was Yigson? Are you blind? Do I actually look like I'm part of your disgusting race? I'm Mitizen. It's my curse that I was born with a face like yours. It sickens me every time I see it in the mirror. But today it will aid me in once and for all destroying you and your pathetic people. Why are you doing this? What have we done to deserve your hatred? snapped Delgra. You are Yigzin, do I need any other reason? he snarled condescendingly. Just then sounds of gunfire, screaming and shattering glass echoed from the hallway. What now? muttered Mestra. Sounds like fighting, grunted the Gorg sergeant. Well obviously, you idiot, go find out what's happening, said Mestra. The sergeant pointed towards several of his soldiers, and said, come with me. As they exited the lab, Delgra grinned with satisfaction. It sounds like the cavalry is here to save us, he said. Mestra frowned. Oh, don't get your hopes up. Your chances of, Mestra's words were suddenly cut short as the door to the laboratory blew open, and a gold and gray blur entered the room with an angry roar. A moment later, all of Mestra's soldiers lay dead on the floor. He then heard an angry growl and turned to see a lion standing near him, his skin hanging from his body in dirty, tattered, blood-covered shreds. The lion turned briefly towards Mestra and spied his yigs in uniform. His eyes then panned the room, searching for any other Gorg soldiers that might have escaped from his grasp. As he did this, Mestra drew his pistol and fired at Tagani. But the shot glanced harmlessly off his head and embedded itself in a nearby wall. Mestra's eyes grew wide at this as he began to shake in fear. Tagani soon turned and looked at him curiously. Why did you shoot at me? he asked. He's one of them, shouted Delgra. Mestra pointed his pistol at the major, and shouted, you shut up. Please, calm down, said Tagani. Kill him, Tagani, he's a traitor, shouted Silvers. Tagani, said Persia in curious surprise. She tried to move to get a better view, but couldn't as Bergen held her fast. No, stay put, sweetie, he said. Tagani stared in confusion at Mestra, and then back at Silvers. I can't kill him, he's Yigzin, he replied. No he's not. He's Mitizen. Kill him now, shouted Delgra. 
but I can't. Mestra soon stopped shaking as he realized that the lion couldn't hurt him. You can't kill me, he said with devilish delight. Well, I can, said Persia, her eyes sparkling like little tongues of fire. But Bergen held onto her even tighter as she struggled to get free. Well, then I see we have nothing to worry about from you. However, you have much to worry about from me, gloated Mestra. He then pointed his pistol at Dr. Bergen and was about to fire when, out of the corner of his eye, he saw movement. He turned just in time to see Delgar drawing a pistol from inside his jacket. Mestra's eyes went wide as he spun and fired at Delgra. But his shot missed. Silver's dove for cover as Delgra fired next, his bullet ripping through Mestra's chest like a hammer, knocking him backwards. But the medicine spy kept his feet as he aimed again and fired. But his aim was slightly off as the bullet merely grazed Delgra's shoulder, sending him spinning to the floor. Pain flashed through Delgra like a hot knife as he fell. He hit the ground with a hard thud gripping his pistol tightly as he did so as not to drop it before frantically twisting his body around in an effort to take aim at the lieutenant. However, it took all of his willpower to focus on the situation as pain flooded his body like an inferno. He was amazed that one little flesh wound could cause him such agony. He tried to force his wounded arm to move, but it refused to obey. Realizing that he couldn't continue fighting this way, he reached out with his left hand to grab the gun, and then paused. To his surprise he spotted Mestra laying dead on the floor in front of him, having succumbed to the single bullet wound to his chest. Seeing that the immediate danger had passed, Delgar relaxed, allowing his gun to slip from his fingers and clatter noisily to the floor. Seeing that it was all clear, Silvers rushed to his side and began to check on his commander. How bad is it, grimaced Delgra. Silvers peeled back Delgar's jacket and studied the wound. You'll be fine, you just got grazed, it took a chunk of flesh with it, but little else, said Silvers. Is that all, because it feels like I got my entire arm ripped off, groaned Delgra. It probably hit a nerve, so it's gonna feel worse than it actually is, said Silvers. Wonderful, groaned Delgra. Silvers then took a lab towel and tied it around the wound in an effort to stop the bleeding. Delgra winced as he drew it tight. That should hold you until we can get you down to the infirmary, said Silvers. Assuming we still have an infirmary, muttered Delgra. Just then several Yiggs and soldiers burst into the room followed by Welk. Is everyone all right? In. Here, said Welk, his voice trailing off as he spotted Tagani. Hmm, I appear to have answered my own question, he continued. He then turned to the men behind him, and said, finish sweeping the building. I'll catch up to you in a few minutes. The men immediately obeyed. Can you help me get the major to the infirmary? asked Silvers. Yes, sir, replied Welk. Let me do it. You are needed to help secure the facility, said Tagani. Do what the lion says. I'll be fine, groaned Delgra. Welk obeyed and hurried out of the room. Delgra then climbed painfully to his feet and, swaying slightly due to the pain, put his arm around Sims. Major, please climb on my back. I will take you to the infirmary, said Tagani. Not on your life, fuzzball. You need to stay and watch the doctor, groaned Delgra. Tagani sat down and quietly obeyed. As you wish, he replied. Just then Tagani felt a warm, furry body wrap itself around him and begin crying. He turned and noticed that Persia was holding onto him tightly. Hello, mother, he said kindly. As Persia wept for joy on Tagani's tattered, dirty mane, he gently placed one arm around her shoulder and pulled her in tight to himself. I'm all right, he said kindly. Upon seeing this, Bergen climbed to his feet and studied the lion with interest. You look terrible, young man. What happened to you, he said. I think I broke something, replied Tagani sheepishly. Bergen grinned. Well then, why don't we get a look at that body of yours and see what needs fixing? Black listened intently on the phone. He nodded several times, and said, Thank you. I'll look forward to your report. He then hung up the phone and watched his computer for several moments until a small message icon appeared on the screen. Opening it he quickly browsed the contents and nodded with approval. 
He then turned to his phone and pressed the pager button. Yes, sir, came the secretary's voice. Send an Elgar. Right away, sir. Several minutes later Elgar walked through the door and up to Black's desk. You called, he asked. Yes, I've got some work for you. It would seem that the medicine have decided to meddle in the war. I don't know what they plan to do, but I need to know. Elgar nodded. I'll get right on it. He then turned and left the room as Black's phone began to ring. Black here, he answered. Sir, we've encountered a problem at the Echo Military Science Labs. They've been attacked, came a panicked voice over the phone. Black stiffened. What? When? By who? The Gorg. They hit the place with a couple platoons of shock troops. We think they may have been after Dr. Bergen and the Lions. Did they succeed? asked Black. Thankfully, no. Some troops who were returning from the front lines recaptured the labs. Black felt both relief and great anger at this. How did the Gorg find out about the lab? he asked. They were apparently ratted out by a medicine insider passing himself off as a Yigson officer. Black cursed lightly under his breath. Was anybody hurt? he asked. Just a handful of soldiers and an officer. I'm sending you the report now. But I wanted to call you in advance so you knew to pay close attention to it when it comes through. There's also something near the end I think will greatly intrigue you. I look forward to reading it. Oh, wait. It just arrived. Good, I'll leave you to read. Talk to you soon. Bye, said the man. Black hung up his phone and began eagerly reading the report, grimacing at some points, while smiling at others. But as he did, something caught his eye. He read it, backed up, and read it again, and then sat back as he rubbed his chin in thought. It appears that Tegani is already making quite a name for himself in this war. This is especially good news since the new prototypes will be ready very soon. If they perform as well as he has, we may actually win this war. But I need to protect those assets as much as I can. He then picked up the phone and dialed a number. When they answered, Black said, I need you to organize a move of everyone at the Echo Military Science Labs to my laboratory in the northwest near the mountains ASAP. Understood, came the reply. Thank you, replied Black, and then hung up. He again stared at the report in front of him, thought for a moment, and then picked up the phone and dialed another number. An older gentleman answered. Senator Jocelyn, this is Farrell Black. Ah, Mr. Black, what can I do for you? I need to build some more lions. Lions, said the senator in surprise. Robotic lions. I think you've already heard about Tegani, right? Well, yes, I've heard a lot about him lately. Fascinating creature he is, even for a robot. I need you to get me approval and funding from the general secretary so I can begin producing more units just like him. More, said Jocelyn in surprise. Yes. How many are you planning to make? Approximately 650, plus spare parts at this point. The senator thought about this for a few moments. Are you, by chance? building a droid army? More or less, but I'm doing it because we need them. Without more of those lions, we may lose this war. But why 650 specifically? No particular reason. I just figured that'd be a good start. But, if not, then we can build more as they are needed. That's fine. But what will happen to them after the war? We'll worry about that when the time comes. For now we need to focus on winning. I don't know, Mr. Black. I like your idea, but at the same time, I'm leery of allowing 650 of those things to run freely across the continent doing whatever they want. They wouldn't be wandering around freely. They'd be under the direct control of our troops the entire time, said Black. No, no, that's not what I mean. Tegani has free will, right? Yes. Then it stands to reason that the others will also have free will. As such, there's nothing to say that they won't turn on us during, or after the war. All of the new lions will be loaded with a copy of Tegani's AI Corps program. He's already proven trustworthy and loyal to a fault, so it only stands to reason that the others will be just as loyal as he is. 
do you actually trust him that much? asked the senator in surprise. I've seen nothing that would make me believe otherwise. The senator sighed heavily and grunted slightly. Dang it, Black. You'd better be right about this. My butt's on the line here. And if this fails, it's going to come back to haunt both of us. Senator, if this fails, I will take personal responsibility for whatever happens. You'd better, growled Jocelyn. So, do I have your support? The senator sighed. Yes, you do. I'll go ahead and start putting things in motion for you. But at the first sign of trouble I'll see to it that they put your butt in jail. I understand, Senator. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate what you're doing for me. Black then hung up the phone and turned to his computer. Drat, he may become a problem at some point. If he does, I'll have to ensure that he's eliminated, and a suitable replacement put in his place, he muttered to himself. Well, no matter. If all goes well in the meantime, our country will be saved. After that little mess is cleaned up, I will need to focus on the next step of my plans for the world. Wake up, Tegani, came Bergen's voice. Tegani's body jerked slightly and then relaxed as his eyes opened and quickly adjusted to his surroundings. Bergen smiled as the robotic lion raised one paw, flexed it, and then the other, examining both of them with curiosity. So, what do you think? asked Bergen gleefully. My body feels different, said Tegani. That's because I've given you an entirely new one. The other was in such bad shape that I couldn't repair it. So I moved your brain core into this new one instead. But even if it is a new body, it should not feel like this, said Tegani. Well, that's probably because your new body is made from the parts that were set aside for the new prototypes I was working on. Now, if everything works as designed, you should be stronger, faster, more durable, and more agile than before. Tegani shook out his mane and then flexed his body experimentally. May I try it out? I want to see what its capabilities are, he said. By all means, exclaimed Bergen. Tegani then turned and slipped outside, hurrying over to the facility's obstacle course where he pushed his body to its limit, testing its full abilities while making note of its every strength and weakness, how it responded in given situations, and what was noticeably different about its performance compared to his former body. Eventually he stopped, sat down, closed his eyes, and began processing everything he'd learned, comparing it to the vast array of information about his former body that he had stored in his mind. But, as he did this, a familiar odor tickled at his sensors. It was one that he was well familiar with, and yet surprised to sense it. Hello, Tegani, came a warm, familiar voice. Tegani opened his eyes and noticed Mishwa staring at him from a nearby stump. Why are you here? he asked as he sat up. How do you like your new body? asked Mishwa. Tegani raised a paw and studied it. It is most intriguing. Why do you ask? he replied. Mishwa smiled. It's a gift from me. Tegani cocked an eyebrow in intrigue. How is it from you? My father built this body. You, however, did not. Mishwa shook his head. Your body is my creation. Your father was merely the hands by which it was built. Then it is like a house, where one designs it and the other builds, asked Tegani curiously. Mishwa nodded. Tegani found this intriguing. But why, wouldn't it have been easier for you to have built it yourself? There are times when the architect is also the builder, and others where he merely provides the plans, and another builds for him. Tegani tilted his head in curiosity. Then what you have done through him is much like what I do for you as your proxy. Mishwa chuckled. It is. Tegani sighed and then looked away. But I am insufficient for the task that you have put before me. My strength is weakness, and my courage is fear. Thus I am unable to do all that you require of me. Mishwa smiled. You do not need to do it all by yourself. Tegani looked at Mishwa in concern. But how? Who is there that is strong enough to stand with me? There are none who possess the strength required for this task, he said. A time is coming when I will raise up a great army of your kind, the likes of which has never been seen before. 
In this you will gain many brothers and sisters who will fight beside you against your enemy and, in doing so, save your people. Tegani nodded at this. Such are comforting words. But, even if there were ten thousand of me, many will still die. Mishwa walked over to Tegani, knelt down in front of him, and kindly took the lion's face into his hands. War is a messy affair. Even my greatest servants could not protect the lives of everyone in their charge. So do not be dismayed that some have fallen, as many more will die before it is through. Tegani thought about this. Such a statement is indeed logical. However, who will it be that dies, and who will live till the end, he asked, a hint of anxiety in his voice. Mishwa shook his head. That is not for you to know. Now go, and fulfill your destiny. And with that, he was gone. Tegani laid back down, closed his eyes, and thought about this encounter. But, the more he thought, the more questions it created. Finally he decided that he would not receive any more answers to his questions until Mishwa appeared to him again. As such, until then, he had other work to do, including perfecting his new body.